we had two tenants in different apartments that were drug dealers. So I kind of let the rumor out that I'm a former law enforcement officer before we closed. And shockingly enough, those people moved out. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And Icon Realty Group, helping home buyers, sellers, and investors in the West Michigan area. Find out more at the iconrealtygroup.com. Hello and welcome to episode 97. Tyler Sheff is our guest today, and he has figured out a way to build wealth by finding problems, figuring out how to solve those problems, and determining where the profit lies in between. Tyler is the founder of CashflowGuys.com. He's the host of Cashflow Guys podcast, and he's a master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cashflow 101 game. So if you haven't figured it out already, Tyler is 100% focused on investing for cash flow and helping others do the same in the process. Tyler, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. For those of our listeners who aren't familiar with you, why don't you give us a, a little bit of insight into your background and, and who you are and what you're all about? I got into real estate many years ago, mainly because I wanted to earn extra money. My mother was a real estate broker. It seemed to make sense. I got into real estate early on and discovered that I'm not the kind of guy that does, oh, look how pretty the curtains are. That didn't work for me. Um, I needed something a little more real, a little more tangible. So I got into the investing side and I catered to investors, which led me to become a house flipper. So I was that guy, you know, before Home and Garden Television came out. Uh, but, you know, sometimes when those things went wrong uh, on Home and Garden Television, for whatever reason, I didn't get the same outcome that they did, you know, <laughs> where I didn't lose any money. But uh, no, we did uh, we did a ton of flips here in Florida, and uh, that created a huge tax bill for me. And I decided that uh, I just I, I sold all my properties. I had a bunch of big portfolios, sold them all off way before the crash. Got some great upside, paid incredible taxes that would blow most people's mind. Went to get a real job. Went to work for the government because I didn't want to have the up and down income that a flipper experiences. Well, I did a little too good of a job working for the government. They started paying me a lot of money, and I was right back to my same tax situation, which when I researched online, what's the best way to legally eliminate my taxes? Everybody kept saying the same thing. You need to buy real estate, but this time, knucklehead, hang on to it. So that's what I did. I started buying property and holding it, and the rest is history. So I, you uh, talk about the tax consequences of doing the, the flipping and the rehabbing. Uh, could, could you go into a little bit more detail on those? Well, what I learned early on in my, in my research is that, and this is after I'd flipped a little late. You know, I'm, always, I'm one of those guys that's always a little late to the party. But um, I discovered that how you're taxed depends on how you earn your income. So for me, I was earning the highest taxed income out there is uh, earned income. And... That's how I was earning all my income. It was I was flipping properties. It was short-term gains, and I was just getting nuked in taxes. And what I discovered, though, is that if I put myself in a position to change how I earned my money, I could also change how the government taxed me on those earnings. And I realized by just simply changing the method how I make my money, I could virtually eliminate my tax bill. That was a mind-blowing revelation for me. So as a... as a flipper, the money you were making was short-term money, so it was considered by the IRS to be um, earned income. Is that correct? Correct, ordinary income. Wait, ordinary income, so which would then be taxed depending on how much money you make that year, you know, anywhere from what twenty-five to thirty-five percent. Yep, yeah, right in there. And what I discovered though is, and to keep it simple, is if you earn piles of income, the government taxes you at in piles. If you earn streams of income, they tax you in streams. So for me, I needed to figure out, okay, instead of making $20,000 now uh, and then giving, let's say, 40% of it to the government because, you know, they got FICA, they got all these different taxes that come in. So let's say it's 40%, so I'm keeping 60%. That means I have to work 40% harder to make back the taxes. But realistically, they're going to tax that too. So it becomes this never-ending cycle. Instead, if I said, okay, how much do I need to live? What is my rat race escape number? 
my I came up with my expenses, and I think at the time it was like I don't know twenty eight hundred bucks or something like that. It wasn't much. And I, if I just could create that in passive income, and do and I wouldn't have to ever worry about money again because I've always got the stream of income coming in, a predictable stream of income that covers my bills, so I could have that sigh of relief. And because I did that, I and I and I spend most of my time, or in this case, all of my time engaged in real estate investing activities. I could qualify for what they call passive income losses. And I won't go deep into that explanation because I'm not a CPA. I'm not a tax expert. People can research that. But when I changed how I thought about earning, I also changed the end result of my taxation. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So let's let's put that into practical terms. I mean, that was the problem. You needed to change the way you were taxed. What was the solution? What, what, in, what did you go out and do once you realized that? Well, a couple of solutions. In other words, it was several solutions, actually. But to start, instead of flipping properties, I needed to hang on to them. And I could make my I could make a smaller amount of money every month in, in the, the net cash flow off of a property. So let's say I buy a house and that thing cash flows after paying all the bills and paying a property manager and paying everybody, I still walk away with three, four hundred dollars a month. So that three hundred four three to four hundred dollars a month is my net income. I'm only taxed based on that three or four hundred dollar amount. Now I know that I have that amount coming in for as long as I can forecast in the future. So now I can go to my CPA and say, hey, CPA, here's $400 of income I didn't have yesterday. How can I mitigate the coming, the future taxes on this? And he will sit down and help me develop a strategy to help mitigate the taxes on that. Part of that would be I can write off the interest on the mortgage. It's an investment property. I can write off the repairs. There are ways you can structure depreciation, uh, both straight line and, and uh, other types of depreciation on the property and the and sometimes the the contents of it, which led to, if I can get into bigger properties, I can also get into bigger tax advantages. And I got to the point, Brian, that I didn't need any more tax advantages, which was a little confusing to me. My, my accountant said, geez, you know, there's really nothing else you can do at this point. You've, you've maxed out. I mean, you've got more, so much depreciation now because I've got, now I'm buying apartment buildings. So I learned that he says, well, if you've got people that you know that have a similar tax situation to you, in other words, they pay a lot of tax, like I used to, you can help them. You can bring them in as a partner on this deal, give them equity, and also give them the tax savings. I went, really? And that's how we started leveraging other people's resources. I think that kind of speaks to the idea of solving problems to uh, to uh, build wealth. And uh, you uh, you are a licensed real estate problem solver. Uh, explain what that, that means and, and how you apply that in, in real life. Well, a lot of agents, they, they're out there to sell the pretty house. Nothing wrong with that. I used to do that too. But what I've discovered is that, number one, my highest revenue uh, comes from solving people's problems. And sometimes that could be, I need to, I need a bigger house because my family's growing. Or uh, that could be, I have this money sitting in the bank and I'm getting, and I keep earning more money and I'm getting taxed to death. And I'll give you an example of how my real estate license helps somebody solve a problem. The recently I had a doctor come to me, lives out in Texas. She makes, she pays a quarter million dollars in taxes. And I no, I didn't mistake that. That's $250,000 in taxes every year. That's her tax bill. This woman needs help and she owns no assets, believe it or not. So I put her with a CPA that could first help her make a tax plan. Is that a commissionable event for Tyler? No, absolutely not. But it does build a relationship. So one of the things the CPA said is that, uh, young lady, you need to acquire some assets because you, you just make way too much money. So who does she know in the real estate business that could possibly help her acquire cash flowing assets? Gee, I wonder. So then she calls me and says, Tyler, I need to buy a whole bunch of assets, which I fire up my team. My people go out. We find her some good uh, cash flowing long term hold opportunities and we sell her these assets. In other words, we, we go to MLS. We look at off market. We sell her these properties. Now that she has these properties, it changes her tax picture, therefore solving her problem. So you started with the tax uh, situation. And, and then kind of fit the, the property or the type of investment uh, into her, her tax situation to give her maximum uh, benefits in, in that direction. Absolutely right. What I do, see, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. So I'm actually the dumbest guy in the room. But what I do is surround myself with people that are smarter than me. Cliche, call it what you will, but it's reality. 
So I've got really good tax people. I've got good tax attorneys, CPAs, regular attorneys, real estate attorneys, you name it. When I can get in contact with somebody, like if you come to me and say, I have this situation, it's either I'm not making enough money on my, uh, my money in the stock market. In other words, I'm not profiting enough or I'm paying too much tax or I don't have any money. How do I get more? I can plug them into a solution. And that's what Cashflow Guys became. That's what Cashflow Guys is all about. We solve people's money-related problems. Can you talk a little bit more then about building wealth, how you help people or, or how you build wealth by finding uh, the problems and not necessarily the properties? Well, one example would be, let's say, I had this kid a couple, well, about a year ago. He was starting out in life. He's in his 20s has a decent job, makes a good income, right? He's making, I don't know, 50, 60,000 a year, not, not bad. He qualifies for an FHA mortgage. And he came to me, he says, you know, I gotta, I gotta, get, my, I gotta get my passive income on. He, he read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, listens to my show, and he read the book, it changed his life. Read the name, I made him read Cashflow Quadrant, and he got that down pat, and he's like, but I mean, I gotta, my, his mom was sick, and all this was going on. And I said, you know, what's what's your real problem? And he he di you know self diagnosed himself. He says, I need passive income. I've got to get some passive income, so that I don't have to work as, as much, and that allow me to take care of my mom. And that's admirable. So I, what I did is I got this kid squared away with an FHA mortgage. He and mom moved into a duplex, into one unit, and then they rented out the other, which subsidized his living expenses. So essentially, house hacking. We'll call it duplex hacking, right? See, that in a year, he was able to then move out of that property. He, he still keeps it, but he's able to move out of it. Somebody else replaces that apartment, moves into that apartment he was in, and he goes and does the same thing over and over again. So now we're in the second year, and this kid's already, he's racking up now about $600 a month in passive income that he never had before. I take that back. He just got the other one. So that'd be $900 a month of extra revenue by moving. That was his job. He had to move. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. Yeah, I love the uh, the concept of house hacking as a way to get into real estate and, and build that passive income. I just think it's a fantastic way to begin building your real estate portfolio. It sounds like you're helping people invest passively for cash flow in real estate. Can you talk a little bit about the type of real estate you're investing in? You know, kind of where you started and where, where you are now. We started again with the house flip, but we quickly transferred to, when it came to holding for long term, I had to ask myself a question. How much time do I have to build this part of my income? And my wife and I asked, looked at it and said, you know, for me to do this full time, I had to quit my government job. And I was getting ridiculously overpaid working for the government. You know, I made a lot of money working for the government. And I got to travel the world for free. So it's all order. And, and if I, we, I, single family houses is what I knew. It's what I understood. So my knee jerk reaction was to go with single family houses. And then I started to do the simple math and think, how many houses do I have to acquire every year to hit my income numbers? And understand that I needed to replace my income from the government really quick uh, if I was to quit my job because I only had six months paid leave saved up. So for me, it became natural to scale the fastest to think about multifamily. But I got to tell you, Brian, I was that guy that was like, well, they came to me and said, you don't have enough experience to buy multifamily. And I started thinking to myself, what do you mean I don't have the experience to buy multifamily? I can buy a, a, a Lamborghini if I want to. Right. And if I show up to the dealership and I have the money, you're going to tell me I don't have the driving experience to drive a Lamborghini. And these brokers kept telling me this, this, this type of stuff. And frankly, some sellers kept saying, well, what's your experience? We want to see your schedule of real estate owned. I'm like, well, I want to see your bank account and you know, some other things. I just didn't understand why there was such a pushback, why I couldn't, why wasn't I allowed to, to play in this, in this boys club or whatever you call it. And it bothered me. And I decided I wasn't going to let that stop me. This can't be that much more complex, really. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you've got somebody paying you money every month 
for a certain amount of square footage that they choose to live in. I mean, how hard can it be? So I dove in and hired a mentor early on. I hired a coach uh, who helped me put me in the right direction to stop making, you know, to not avoid a lot of the simple mistakes that most people would make early on. And I hired him and he, we immediately dove into larger multifamily. I started with a four unit building to date. That has been my best deal. i that thing is such a ridiculous cash cow. It's disgusting. I'm so proud of myself for that. (laughs) Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that four unit? That one was, so I'm a veteran and I served my country. And because of that, I'm qualified to receive a, a veterans, a VA mortgage. So I went to a mortgage broker and got pre-approved to buy a property. And I discovered that I could buy up to four units with my VA mortgage. And over four units is considered commercial. Therefore, they wouldn't let me go over four, which is fine because I was just starting out and I was of the mindset I wanted to start small. But what's interesting is I I was under contract to buy a duplex that my wife and I had rented that's literally right on the ocean. And we were... Our mindset was a lot different than there was now. Going Looking back, it wouldn't have been a good investment for us, I don't think, over the long term. Uh, and mainly because of the price point and the value. I just didn't, we were paying for the view, uh, not necessarily buying it for its investment quality. Long story short, we were under contract to buy that. The owner just had an unscrupulous person in our community come in and, and basically backdoor us, even though we were under contract got the seller to sign a second contract offering him $50,000 more. And then the seller said, sorry, have a nice day. And I'll hope, by the way, you have to move out in 30 days. <laughs> it's like, you got to be kidding me. So here I am running around with this $215,000 pre-approval letter. Actually, no, I take that back. It's like 417000 was the max we could buy. And we're thinking, wow, what are we going to do? Well, I started doing the numbers and realized that I needed to find something. If I was going to find a property that rented for about seven. $800 a month, I would need to find something in the somewhere around the 200000 price point. Coming back from, now, admittedly, I was not looking necessarily for a multifamily. We needed a place to live in 30 days. So my wife and I were out driving around, drove by this property and saw this, this unit that I own now, saw this building and it was, oh my gosh, was it ugly? It was actually a pumpkin orange with brown trim. It looked like a pumpkin. I used to, we called it the pumpkin pumpkin property, but it was, it was concrete block, uh, two duplexes side by side, identical. There's four units or two bedroom, one bath inside laundry. I thought this place is kind of cool. Everything, but the nasty color and the lack of landscaping and anything that regards taste. It looked like 1980 inside and it was in a great neighborhood, but the landlords were, the landlord was a real estate broker and she had it in the market for nine months, no takers. So I had a phone call with her and the phone call started with, Hey, I need a place to live. First of all. Uh, so is that apartment? You got one for rent, which is what triggered us to it in the first place. And she said, yeah, it's available. We looked at that apartment and it wasn't bad granted, but it still looked like 1980. And my wife's kind of shaking her head going, you better figure out how to buy this because this isn't going to last. I can't live like this forever. But, um, we had a conversation with her and discovered it was for sale. And we were able to negotiate it down to about 200 and I think it was 215 is what we wound up paying for it for four units. And at the time they were renting for 600 and one vac- one unit was vacant. We had two tenants in different apartments that were drug dealers. And then one guy was like a long-term truck hold truck driver. So I kind of let the rumor out that I'm former law enforcement officer uh, before we closed. And shockingly enough, those people moved out. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how that happens. No eviction required. I just said, oh, this is going to be great. I can have, you know, I still got all my friends are police officers. It's great. We can go over here, drink beer. It'll be awesome. You can join us. <laughs> I'd also like to tell you about Joshua Schaub and his team at Icon Realty Group, a full service real estate company in the West Michigan area. Joshua has been a guest on this show several times, and he and his team at Icon Realty Group help buyers gain an edge in this competitive market. They assist sellers in getting the best price and terms for their properties, and they work with investors to understand the numbers, neighborhoods, and market forces that will set them up for long-term success. To learn more and get a free, no-obligation consultation, contact Joshua at 616-216-2000 or visit the IconRealtyGroup.com. So you you didn't have any awkward confrontations with them? They just Uh, moved out before that happened, huh? Well, the day before closing, there were two U-Hauls out front, one for each apartment. They were moving on their own. What a shame. Mm. So we renovated the place, spent about 50000 renovating it, including our unit, getting it all done up. 
started renting them immediately for 900 a month. That was in December of 2014. And it, uh, market rent has climbed to about 1200 for these buildings. But just recently, I had this thing appraised. Now, I've done a few changes with how we rent it. We, we changed two of the units over to uh, short terminals, the Airbnb type thing, right? Oh, wow. And that's worked out well. That's a whole lot of work, let me tell you. But it's worked out well. It pro- it's very profitable. We've basically 3 x our rents. So nothing wrong with that. But the we just appraised, and the appraisal came back at 429000 So you just about doubled the value then? In two years, yeah. And, oh, that was two years ago you bought this. And you're down in Florida, right? I'm in Florida. I'm in Tarpon Springs in the Tampa Bay market, Tampa Bay area. And and you and your wife are, are living in one of these units? Yeah, initially we had to move in for one year because it was a VA mortgage. Mm, okay. So we did that, no problem. And frankly, we were building it to the way we want to live. And, you know, we'd like nice things. So we dialed it in. Some would think that we over-improved it. But the reality is we made it so beautiful here that everybody wanted to live here. And when I put the for rent sign up on the first the first time, I had over 100 people apply to live here inside of a week. Wow. If I, yeah, it was crazy. So I found a great some great tenants. And they we went through a set of tenants. But... I've never had any vacancy here at all, which is beautiful because I'm very conservative when I do my underwriting. I had allowed for 15% vacancy loss. Well, last year's vacancy loss money sent my wife and I to Belize to go look for more property. (laughs) Well, that is great. That's a grand slam home run there on your first uh, multifamily. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you brought up the, the Airbnb thing. Um, you said it's a lot of work. I know I know a lot of people are looking at that. Some, some are doing it, and you hear about you know getting three times your income. What, what are the downsides of that? Uh, is it just the additional work, or what, um, what, what's your thoughts on Airbnb? That's a big one. The, the Airbnb client is a lot different than what your, necessarily your long-term tenant would be. So for me, um, it, that took a little bit of getting used to. They have needs like... You know, they, they need toilet paper at 10 o'clock on a Thursday because they've used 10 rolls and they expect you to per, provide it. It's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Uh, things like that that come up. And I got to tell you, it's a lot of work. There's probably 30 different websites you can advertise on and there's services out there that will syndicate it. But the setup is cumbersome. It, it takes a while. There's really not any good reliable research data out there. There's lots of websites that try to offer it, but it's it's very hit or miss. So there's not a lot of good factual historical data to look at when you're trying to underwrite these things. So you're doing a lot of guessing, uh, which I don't like. I'm a conservative investor. I don't like to lose money and I don't like to speculate. And unfortunately- wait, wait. Are you guessing on like how much you're able to charge and how what your occupancy is gonna be? Is that is that what you're referring to? Yes, it is because there's really no, you're not comparing apples to apples. You know, there's, 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 at least in my market, it's so diverse. You know, I, you can be five miles apart and it can be a major swing in, in price wow. and in occupancy. But it sounds like you've found that you're able to get three times the income you would if, if you were renting. Does that mean your occupancy turned out pretty good and your, your rental rate turned out it, it where has. it needed to be? It has. Now, in my market, when it's slow, it's slow like crickets. We Summertime, nothing really happens here in my immediate market. What's interesting though, is that five miles down the road in Clearwater, they don't have any vacancy. I have a friend that she's got a couple of them in one apartment building. She's essentially had no vacancy. She's been book solid for months, all through summer, where in my, my area, these places are sitting empty for an entire month. The good news is, is that in the busy season, which for us starts around October 1st and goes on until May, we are booked solid. So mathematically, we wind up netting about double market or the usual long-term rent you know in the busy season we're collecting 3x sometimes 4x of uh, the rent and then but over the course of the year you figure you're about doubling your rent when it all all the dust settles well, what are some of the other investments you're doing now my favorite thing right now is uh, non-performing notes i gotta tell you uh, multifamily market's been tight lately finding out good opportunity is, is tough it's a challenge so we are not in a position to buy a bad investment just to buy an investment. You know, we will, we work exclusively with other people's money. We raise private capital via syndicate and joint venture partnerships and things like that. So for us, 
we got to make sure that everybody wins. Uh, it's very important to us. And we're not going to just place money in a, in a bad deal just to do a deal. So that said, we've backed off a little bit on multifamily. Uh, we're very strict in our underwriting guidelines. And for us, non-performing notes, we've been in them now for about two years and they're consistently performing for us. I mean, I got to say, we're knocking it out of the park. I probably shouldn't say that because then I'm going to get a little surprise probably one of these days. But <laughs> it's a... Uh, they're nice. I mean, they are a beautiful investment. They, I mean, they really are. We've had a, a guest on the show in the past uh, talking about investing in non-performing notes. Can you tell us, uh, for those who aren't familiar with what that is, can you explain? Yeah, the simplest thing is, is that you've got two types of notes. You've got performing and non-performing. And non-performing means that somebody, whoever is the, the owner, the holder of the, the, uh, the, the borrower is not paying the bill. So let's use a $100,000 mortgage. For whatever reason, the person, the owner of the property has stopped paying the mortgage. That means the status of it transfers over to non-performing. Banks ha deal with this on a regular basis. So after a certain period of time, banks want to get these toxic assets off their books. So when a note's non-performing, they will do try to do a workout. But after a given amount of time, they decide, well, this is more than we want to mess with. We'd rather sell this note at a discount and we'll move on and that'll recharge our coffers, and then we'll go loan somebody else money and hope they pay. So we come in then and buy the note from the banks, and we're buying them generally between 30 and 40 cents on the dollar on average. So in that example, a $100,000 note, we're going to pay between 30 and $40,000 for the note. Now, what's important to note is that, no pun intended, that we own the debt but not the property. Okay, so the, the, the house is still owned by... Uh, Jim Smith. Jim Smith is in a, having a hard time. He can't pay his mortgage. I become Bank of America or Wells Fargo. And I would send him a letter. I will have our collection company reach out to him and say, we understand you're having a hard time. How can we help? We, Because we're actual people, um, we, can, we can look at things a little more objectively than, let's say, a big bank would. You know, we can put more of a personal feel to it. Why are you having problems, Jim? Well, I lost my job, but I got a new one. Okay, good. You see, I don't have any check boxes because I'm just, I'm Tyler Chef. I'm a regular guy. And I can have conversations with people. And again, going back to solving problems, I can help them solve their own problem. Like, do you like your house? Yes. Do you want to stay there? Well, yeah, my kids have been born here. I built this house with my own two hands. That's great. Let's figure out a solution that will let you keep the house. And that could be maybe we change the terms of the note uh, to allow him to make it, make it affordable again. We can put them into a credit management program where they we do uh, we can help them repair their credit and get their credit back on track so they can eventually refinance this out. So sometimes we'll change the terms of the loan to help them get themselves back on track, also help them fix their credit so they can go back to a bank and get a new 30-year note in a couple of years and get their life back on track, you know, drop their payments, things like that. Sometimes, unfortunately, we have to foreclose. Uh, and take the property by by legal action, which is unfortunate when we have to do that. But when, when that happens, we will turn around and sell the asset, the house, or the apartment building, whatever it is. We will sell that just like any other bank would as an REO. Yeah, it's, it, there's two interesting things that you just brought up there uh, regarding buying non-performing notes. One is that you can do things that the bank cannot do. The bank has certain guidelines and restrictions, but you as an ordinary guy can work more directly with the owner, it sounds Absolutely. like. Yep. Um, so you have more flexibility uh, and ability to help them out and, and in essence, solve their problems. The, the other thing of note is that you might be buying a note, <laughs> I just used the same pun, you might be buying a note uh, for a, that's worth $100,000, but the underlying value of the property could be one hundred twenty, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Absolutely, and and you're buying that hundred thousand dollar note at thirty to forty percent uh, value. Exactly. There's a lot of upside there. Is this something that uh, are, have you formed a syndication to raise money to to purchase these notes in bulk? We are not doing a syndication at this point. We consulted with our legal team. Uh, they felt better about us structuring these. Where We didn't want to co-mingle more than one investor's funds into any particular note. So to alleviate that from happening, we structured it as a joint venture, which means that the, the, in, the person who's bringing the capital in has joint ownership in the note with us. We're partners in the note, so to speak. 
So if you and I did a deal on a note, it would be in Brian's name or Brian's LLC's name and my LLC and my partner Paige's LLC. We co-own this note. So that just creates a cleaner transaction. Your money is not commingled with anybody else's. We tend to focus on notes that are generally under a quarter million, you know, to kind of release our, or to spread our, our risk out over several different properties instead of dumping all of our eggs in one basket. And that helps, you know, mitigate loss. Can you give us an example of a, of a note purchase that you've, you've done and, and how the numbers worked out on that? Absolutely, I can do that. But I'm going to have to pull up a spreadsheet here real quick and, and show you. But how these, and the thing that people have to realize is that the key to making money in notes really all comes down to the due diligence. And it's not, there are websites out there, you can buy notes off of some of these websites. But what's important to note is all you're buying, it's like you're buying a sheet of paper, really. You're, you got to look beyond that and you got to look at the due diligence file and make sure you're not buying somebody else's major problem because remember a lot of these banks were did some irresponsible lending back in the day but let me give you an example of, of one we did recently this one was let's see here i'm looking at the numbers we bought a note for twenty eight thousand five hundred. okay uh we did a workout on it and it cost us sixty six thousand or sixty six hundred dollars to do a workout so our cash out is thirty five thousand we got thirty five thousand invested in this note we sold the property we foreclosed and sold the property for 65,000 that yielded us a, a return of 29,900 or 85% nice and, and what was the timeline how long did it take you to, to get to that point that was uh, 11 months so in one year you're looking at an 87% is 87% return 85% return 85% return yeah, that's uh, that's pretty good. But it's uh, purchasing non-performing notes is not something that just anybody can go do. I mean, you can't. There's no open market for that. How how do you uh, uh, find these non-performing well, notes? Unfortunately, there are like I said, there are some websites out there that will sell you a non-performing note right off off the shelf. The problem is they don't. You don't have any idea what you're buying, and you're right. You, they're not. They're open to any. You're right in the fact that. And I suppose anybody can buy them, but not anybody, not everybody's going to make a profit. And unfortunately, most people that buy these without having the experience behind it are almost always going to lose money. I can almost guarantee you, you're going to buy a bad note and you're going to take a financial loss. You have to think about that going in if you don't have systems in place. Yeah, Have you seen that happen? Uh, I have. We have not, knock on wood, had that happen to us, but we hear this constantly We've got people that have come to us and now invest with us as joint venture partners after they've tried to do it themselves and they've lost their shirt in the, in the whole thing. Uh, it doesn't take more than one fifty thousand dollar loss for someone to go, geez, maybe I should either hire someone to teach me how to do this, which we do a modified version of that because our, our investors are active. They're not passive. That's the difference here. Uh, with the syndicate, they're more passive. We want our investors involved so to some degree, which is cool because they want to learn. And, we live in an abundance. We don't really care if they go do it on their own at some point down the road. It's not a big deal to us. We, we encourage them. We want them to be involved in the process, and that helps us too. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the services you offer? Because you've got your podcast. You've got your cashflowguys.com. Uh, it sounds like you, you do some coaching as well. Uh, fill us yeah. in on, on what it is you have to offer. On, a, on the top level, we raise private capital from, from investors that are looking to either acquire multifamily properties or and or non-performing notes. And some people choose to do both. Some people lean one way or the other. So we can solve that that problem with that arm of the business, the note, business, the note or the, the realtor arm. Uh, that's our core business. What we've discovered is that a lot of the people that we would work with, they lack the information to be able to make good, sound decisions. In other words, they need to learn, but they're not necessarily trying to build this epic business for themselves. Either they, they want to be an educated consumer. So for that, we put out lots of free uh, materials to them and low-cost materials to give them the information they need to make good, solid decisions. Because I believe an educated buyer is a, is a, is a profitable buyer. And when they're profitable and they win, then they tell their friends, and I don't have a big advertising budget. So... <laughs> It works out quite well for us. In addition to that, there are people that want to take things to the next level, and that's what Cashflow Guys is all about, is they want to, they need the coaching, the mentoring, 
Uh, we've got several different programs available to fit the bill, but we're not this $150,000 boot camp, rah, rah, rah type company. Uh, that's not what we do. Uh, we're not looking to educate millions of people. We're looking to educate people that are willing to take action and that are going to take action. So for us, you know, our masterminds and things like that that are coming up this year, we're going to interview people. It's not like something you're going to be able to buy on a squeeze page and we don't really care if you succeed or fail. No, no, you're going to interview with us. We're going to have conversations, understand what you expect and make sure you're clear on what we're going to do. And we're going to offer you a, a, a good value. And we're going to handhold you through the process so you actually get the deal done. And now with us, there's none of this. And if you sign up now, you can use our money for your deals. And da, 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 you know, that never happens. I mean, how often do those things actually come true? So no gimmicks, good, honest business. You know, teaching people how to discover opportunities, how to find value. That's what we do. No hype. And you mentioned uh, investing in, in apartments. I, I know that I think you just, you also said that, that that market's pretty tight right now. But what can you talk about some of the apartment deals that you've done? Yeah, we've done some where, like up in Tennessee, for example, we buy and talk about fi solving problems. We generally focus on two types of, of properties up there. But with the stuff that my wife and I enjoy doing without other people, because most people are scared of it, we like the properties that nobody else will buy. We, we look for uh, properties that are in really bad shape, properties that nobody else would even consider uh, buying. You know, the places like you drive by and you go, oh my goodness, what happened there? That's right up my alley. I love that kind of stuff. That's what I'm looking for. Well, give, so, us a, give us an example of that type of property. Well, we had one uh, about two years ago, well, about a year ago that we bought that was just an absolute train wreck. I mean, literally... Everybody that lived there, it was 10 units. Everybody that lived there was not on a lease and was not paying rent. And then we didn't even know who they were. They were just squatters. And so literally, it was fully occupied with squatters. If you can believe that, that's a problem. That's a big problem. But the owner, I mean, you can go in and I can buy those for three to $7,000 a door. I have to go solve the problem. I got to kick everybody else out. But when everybody else is paying thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a door, I'm buying them for five to seven thousand a door. So you can see I start out in a much better position. I just am willing to solve problems that other people aren't willing to solve, and that comes down to really, I'm really good at putting teams together. That's my my specialty. That's what I do. That's what I'm really, really good at is getting people to work together. And we built a powerhouse team up in Tennessee. I mean, they are just awesome. What kind of game plan did you put together with your team? on that 10 unit? Well, the first thing we had to do, we've got my property management company, my, the guy that's been doing it, that I work directly with, he's been a property manager, literally his the company's been around since 1943. You can believe that. So they know Memphis intimately. They know everything about Memphis. They have all the relationships with the city government, the police, the whole nine yards. So the first thing we do is we get the police involved. And because of the relationship that we have with Memphis PD, they're proactive in helping us. They know that we're not slumlords, number one. We're there to provide people a safe, clean place to live. Uh, based on that, they give us a little, I wouldn't, I can't really say they give us extra attention, but I would say that they pay attention, I guess, if that makes sense. Things like there are patrol cars parked in my parking lot on a, on a regular basis on a building that we're stabilizing. We'll finish an apartment and give it to the Memphis police to use for six months as a base station. Nobody comes to our property and ha causes any trouble when you've got a police cruiser sitting out front, you know, 16, 18 hours a day, hmm. word gets out. So that alone right there helps us where while everybody else is getting all their construction material materials stolen, I've got a police officer sitting on a stack of drywall. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have the same issues that a lot of other people do. It, it helps out that way. Now, is that because you you're uh, you have a police and, and military uh, experience yourself? I mean, is that you know how to go into uh, you know and talk to law enforcement and get them to be on your side? Has that really helped you? I do, and I'll, and I'll give you a brief example of that. I had a we bought a fourplex over in Tampa recently, and and it, had, it was riddled with problems. You know, the police are called there constantly. And uh, that's one of the reasons I bought it, because I know I can solve that problem. All I got to do is replace the tenants, and I problem solved. The neighborhood is a great neighborhood, one of the best neighborhoods in Tampa. So the first time I show up to meet the police there, we had to basically clear an apartment, because we were in the middle of rehabbing an apartment. 
and we got a call from one of the tenants that the somebody was downstairs in one of the vacant apartments. So immediately I get in the car, drive over there, and, and this one I was coaching somebody through the process, and so I took a student with me so they could get understand the management process. It's one thing to hire a manager, but you have to understand what the manager goes through, and then it, I believe that helps you understand what you should be looking for. So when we brought, bring, brought this property online, we self-managed for a few months until we brought management in. That said, I met the, the city of Tampa police officers over there, and initially they were like looking at me like I'm some kind of slumlord. They're like, you know, if you clean this place up, you probably wouldn't have the problems that you do. You know, we had a shooting here a couple weeks ago. I said, I understand that. And you also understand that I bought the day of the shooting was the day after my closing on this property. And you see those big retina burning uh, LED lights that are up there lighting up the heavens? That's why those are there. And I come to find out he's a Memphis police officer. He was a Memphis police officer. He moved from Memphis down to Tampa, started working for Tampa police. So after that, he's like, he realized that I said, look, I'm former law enforcement. I was a police officer here in town. I get this. Now we're on the same page. Next thing you know, he says, do you mind if I park here when I'm on break and stuff? I'm like, you can park here anytime you want. Matter of fact, here's a combination to the door. If you ever want to go in and sit down and use the bathroom, help yourself. Matter of fact, what I'll do is I'll tell my guys to go ahead and renovate the bathroom first. That way it's nice and clean for you and feel free to use that anytime you want. Well, guess what? Did I ever have any more problems with that building? Absolutely not. So we've changed the paradigm there. What were some of the other techniques you used? I mean, as far as renovating the money you put into the property right from the start, I mean, how, how did all that work out for you? For us, a lot of it comes down to we, as a landlords, we constantly make this mistake. I've stopped making this mistake finally. I'm kind of thick-headed, but we assume what our tenants want. Never do we ask. We are afraid to ask the question because, goodness, they're going to tell me they want granite. Well, you know, some of them will tell you that they want granite. But realistically, to give you an illustration, in Memphis, when we first bought Memphis, the first properties in Memphis a couple of years back, my wife wanted to do the landscaping first. And we have lots of things to take care of. These buildings needed, they were they needed everything. And, and her contention is we get curb appeal, it'll attract tenants, which is totally legit. And I, and I said the same thing. So I called the management company and said, guys, we need to go ahead and do flowers and bushes and, and pressure wash the sidewalks and one of my managers says that's not what we do that's not how we go what we should do is let's go talk to the tenants and find out what the tenants in this building need because there's a unique problem in every part of town so I got on a plane and flew up there and I went and introduced myself to the tenants and I asked them I said what is your biggest concern and they all had one common denominator and it was safety so putting bushes in and flowers would have been a waste of money what they really wanted and ironically were willing to pay for was security doors in this one building. They wanted it lit up like Christmas. So I had the, uh, this. we applied for a grant program, got some lights put in outside, LED lights from the city. And then we put in security doors and raised the rent immediately. So you're willing to pay an extra 50 bucks a month for a security door. And they said, well, yeah, I'm absolutely willing to pay $50 a month and not have my, my head kicked in in the middle of the night. It's like, okay, good. So we're going to change your lease. We're going to up the rent by $50 a month. So if you do that math, folks, it's you know $50 a month in, in 12 months. You're looking at $600 a year increase. Well, guess what? The door cost me $450 installed. Nice. That's pretty those good tenants, feedback. Yeah, those tenants have been there ever since they don't leave because no other landlord is going to provide them that same experience. So they're safe and they just stay there. It works. Yeah, so that's another good example of figuring out what the pro what your tenant's problem is and, and solving that for them. And most people don't ask. I ask, what is, Susan, what is your biggest concern here? John, what affects you the most? Have you ever encountered, you know, as a problem solver, have you ever encountered a problem that you could not solve? Uh, I wouldn't say I have because at the end of the day, I always have a choice over who lives there. You know, we structure our leases to where if things don't work out and we just can't love each other, then someone's going to move and it's not me. <laughs> so so you all, the, your backup plan, if you can't solve the problem, is to, to just get rid of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. We yeah. will relocate the problem to another jurisdiction. And then what would you say is the most challenging problem you've had to solve? I would say, well, that's a tough one because there's been some doozies. Having the biggest problem I think we'd have, we've, 
run across is changing tenants' mindset. In other words, sometimes a uh, new landlord comes into town in Memphis and they will they will immediately they'll buy a, a building, they'll, they'll do kind of a lousy job, they'll go ahead and do the flowers in the bushes, and they'll run the rents down to the bottom. They'll they'll offer for $150 a month less. But sometimes it's it's as little as $25 a month less. And the, the tenants, their mindset is that they're saving money. So they will pack up everything they own and move over 25 bucks. Instead of saying, you know, they don't get that they're really costing themselves more money by doing that. So that has been a challenge, trying to get to them if they move. Not, and sometimes they just don't want to communicate. Uh, the second one I would probably say is getting them to communicate when there's a, a legal issue. If they feel like they're, they're ratting out their fellow person, their neighbor, even though their neighbor's a problem, which is, we've started a new program actually to counteract that. They don't want to call the, they don't want to call us and tattletale, but they're terrified of their neighbors, which doesn't make any sense. Well, Tyler, as we wrap it up here, I'm wondering if you have any, any uh, words of advice for our listeners. I would say my number one piece of advice, and I hope somebody takes this, is if you don't know the answer to a question, don't never assume the answer. Simply ask somebody, especially when it comes to managing tenants. Ask them what they need. Ask them. Reach out to them and find out what makes them tick, what makes them decide to live at your place versus somebody else's. Good advice. Um, so how can people get a hold of you if they, if they want to find out more? The best way to reach out to me is via my website. That's where my, cat, my uh, podcast lives. That's my YouTube channel. I've got my videos on there. Go to cashflowguys.com. That's the best way to get to us. It's got a phone number. You can reach us by text message, by phone, by email, you name it. So that's the number one place to find me. Okay. Well, Tyler, thanks thanks a lot for being on the show today. I mean, it's been, been a pleasure hearing about your experiences, helping uh, solve problems and build wealth in the process. Cashflowguys.com, uh, that's a great place to go to find out more about you. So thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Brian. I really appreciate it. Good time. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And Icon Realty Group, helping home buyers, sellers, and investors in the West Michigan area. Find out more at theiconrealtygroup.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.